Okay, good morning. I'm Lee Chantel and um, thank you to Pawsey Supercomputers for having me today. I'm just going to give a little bit of um, information about myself first and then I'll get into my presentation which will be about 35 minutes and there might be time for Q&A at the end if anyone has any questions. So if you do have any questions while we're going through things please just write them down and I will answer them at the end because I will not be looking at the chat box um, when I'm giving my presentation. Um, my name is Lee Chantel Thank you um, for having me for Data Science Week. And um, I'm interested in cyber psychology, cyber security and digital wellness. I'm a digital wellness instructor and I'm also studying my PhD at the moment. So I'm doing that at Griffith in Brisbane. And um, I'm looking at autonomous vehicles and blockchain technology. So it's a very interesting area. And because I'm interested in the cyber psychology, as in how we interact with um, devices or machines and things like that, this is um, another area of interest for me. Um, so anyway, I might just get into the presentation now and um, Hopefully people can join quite easily. I'm just going to share my screen. Okay, so here we go. Okay, how your data can be used against you. The internet constantly changes and it evolves. And if you think back to when you first joined the internet, I'm sure that you will see the differences to when you joined versus to where we are now. Anonymity is important and it's essential for a free and an open internet. And this is really important because our online footprints are more visible and more permanent as the days and the years go by. COVID has turbocharged digital adoption for contract tracing and movement control apps and also using artificial intelligence or AI for decision making. And these new technologies are yet to show the full extent of their risks, their limitations and the consequences of tracking citizens, students and workers. And also a lot of these technologies have really short-sighted data privacy policies. And it's um, interesting to note that Australia is the only developed country without a digital rights bill. In the day that we are in now, we have an always on culture where we're continuously tethered to our digital devices. They're always at arm's reach. You can always hear them dinging. They're very intrusive in a lot of our lives. And this is especially prevalent with working from home and online learning. And more scrutiny is needed for our practices and the technology that we rely on. COVID has encouraged technology companies, businesses and governments to roll out technology without any understanding or anticipating of risks such as privacy and safety. And tech companies have been designed to collect information about you and to sell it to advertisers. So your data is bundled together to create your digital profile and it's sold to the highest bidder. And the more data that is collected on you, the more risk to your privacy. I'm not sure if you've heard of the term techno solutionism, but this is where we accept technology solutions as quick and easy ways to solve real world and complex issues. Unfortunately, technology is not magic. It's not going to solve all our problems overnight or with a new app. And this is an issue because there's a lot of people in power who come up with some really bad technology ideas and they have the resources to roll these out and to market to consumers. And as I said, these are complex issues. They need deep understanding and true debate to come up with complex and real solutions. And these solutions that techno-solutionism comes with sometimes, often, 
in most cases, harm the most vulnerable people that they're meant to protect. An example of that is robo debt, which we'll talk about in a bit. And there was also an app suggested to verify consent before adults engage in sex. Now, trust in technology fell all around the world last year. It has a trust score of 70 out of 100. And in the past, popularity with technology has helped protect the industry from the critics and the regulators, but this is starting to decline. And social media companies, their trust score is even lower than technology at 46. And this is also lower than other business categories. And this increasing difficult relationship that we're having between technology and the public is blamed for the reason that the trust has fall, fallen. As an examples include misinformation online, bias in AI and privacy issues. And CEOs to gain trust back are encouraged to act first and talk later. And maybe the reason why um, we are not trusting technology anymore is because a lot of the data that is collected um, and shared about us can quite easily be hacked and has been hacked quite a lot. Here's uh, just a few of um, the technology companies that are listed on haveibeenpwned.com. Dropbox, Facebook, Kickstarter, LinkedIn, NurseryCam, Oxfam, Patreon, ProctorU, and Snapchat. And um, just this year, for example, we've had 500 million plus breached accounts from Facebook, which is 20% of their user base. And this was interesting because they were trying to associate the phone number to the identities that they had from other hackings. And then we also had 500 million LinkedIn profiles that were hacked. And in nursery cam, there was 10,000 plus accounts. And Oxfam had 11 million accounts that were hacked into as well, which that one had some partial credit card details exposed. And that's just some of the examples. You can have a look at that website for more information. You can put your email in, see if any of your data may have been compromised, and you can see a list of all the other um, brands and apps. And as you saw from the other slide, there's quite a few different aspects of details that um, can be gathered about you, as well as things such as your phone and email contacts, call logs, passwords, internet and calendar data, your device location and where you frequent, your unique device has a, its own identification and data on how you use your device and your apps and other aspects like age, interest, purchasing habits, your health and social aspects. And this information is collected and it's most likely shared with other companies like third parties, because that's where these apps, especially if they're a free app or free service, that's where they make their money. Now, this is usually disclosed in their privacy policy, but I would doubt that most people have even read a full privacy policy at any stage. They're really long, they're really hard to understand, and some companies don't even have privacy policies. And social media is also an issue. And social media is what a lot of people use on their digital devices. And they've been called out a heap lately, in particular Facebook for many bad practices such as flawed content moderation, rampant tracking, algorithmic bias, harmful recommendations, limited political ad transparency, tax evasion, sexual harassment charges, and a heap more. Um, and in particular, if you wanted to look at some information in um, with Facebook and getting Trump elected, and the um, Capitol Hill coup that happened, this is a great example of how disinformation and hate speech has been accelerated by algorithmic recommendations, which can lead to some really bad in-person things happening. Now, you might think, oh, that's just, that's just a bit of a glitch in the system. That's not what happens regularly. That's not why this, how these things were built and why, but it is profiting off vulnerabilities 
is central to how business models work with tech companies. And by interacting on any social media platform, the information that's gathered about you is used to target you with advertisements that you will click on. And this isn't just for adults. This is also for children and those who are susceptible to um, advertising. And the longer that you engage with this content on social media, the more highly personalized advertising can be sold based on detailed profiles of all your information and all the users. And this includes highly sensitive information. Social media is not regulated and therefore it's difficult to track and it's difficult to understand. And when you are not paying anything for a product, you become the product. Your data is bought and sold and mostly without your knowledge or agreement. And another aspect to think about is how much power all these social media platforms have. So as um, we were reliant on um, technology for the pandemic and for lockdowns, the big seven technology companies increased their powers and their profits. So the big seven are Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Alphabet, which owns Google and Facebook, and along with two from China, Tencent, which owns WeChat and Alibaba. Now, these companies are racing to collect as much personal data as they can, and they just think about money, how easy a service is to use, and immediacy, instead of thinking about the long-term consequences of exposure and that they are targets for attack. And Facebook has been targeted and has been hacked many times, and they don't seem to do much or care much about it happening. And more privacy by design is required than just simply fixing and patching up privacy issues after the event happens. Um, if you use an iPhone, which I know a lot of people do, there's two things that you can have a look to see when someone is using your information. So if you see an orange dot at the top of your screen, whether it's your iPad or your iPhone, an orange dot means that your microphone is active and a green dot means that your camera is active. And this is a visual indication of when an app is using your microphone or your camera. And keep in mind that if the camera um, green dot is there and the, meaning the camera is active, this is also includes your microphone. So you can go into your control center and you can check what app is using your camera or your microphone. And then you can update your access in the privacy section of your settings. And I'd also like to point out that Facebook is not listening to your conversations. You are just so predictable based on your online digital trail, it doesn't even have to. Now, it's the great thing that just came up with a new iPhone update, and you may have heard of this. It's called the App Tracking Transparency or Apple's Cross Track Opt Out. And this stops apps from tracking your activity for advertising, and it uses a prompt like the one you can see on your screen where it asks you, Do you want this app to track you or not to track you, or you can allow it? And it also shows up the data that's used to track you, data that is linked and not linked to you. And originally you could do this by going into your settings and manually requesting to have the tracking off, which is what myself and other people who are concerned about security online do. But only 3% of Americans had actually done this in the past. So it's quite a low amount. And then you can see 55% of people said they would not allow Facebook to track them on any other apps if they were prompted. So this is very interesting because now that people are prompted, we're hoping that they won't have as much tracking. And it's good because I hope 98% um, of Facebook's revenue comes from advertising. So this might really result in a lot of loss of revenue for them. 
and some really good um, signs at the moment. So it was only launched the end of April and just this week there's been some information saying that only 13% of people worldwide and 4% of Americans are actually allowing apps to track them. So there's a heap of people that aren't. So it's very exciting news. And um, security is a really big aspect. Um, with a lot of the stuff that we're doing online, we're normalising surveillance technologies, whether it's spyware for partners, which we'll get into in a bit, or tools for monitoring children, students and workers. We'll also talk about those. This normalising surveillance technology, it increases abuse for vulnerable people and it encourages control. Smart devices and the Internet of Things devices, they collect and share a whole heap of data. And a lot of people don't even understand what's being collected or even understand how to even see that. So our desire for so-called security is its own security threat. There's a great um, website called Privacy Not Included by the Mozilla Foundation. And this is a guide for apps and products and the, the privacy not included are apps and products that do not meet their minimum security standards. These minimum security standards are encryption, automatic security updates, strong password, encouraging you to use a strong password, vulnerability management and privacy practices. They also add um, that uh, apps and products that share, share and sell your data don't allow deletion of your data and um, privacy information um, inf uh, readability and they have a poor track record of data protection. Now there's a heap of different apps and products that they go over in a variety of areas such as your smart home and office, your toys and games, pets, entertainment, wearables, dating apps and even sex toys. So some of the worst products are Amazon Ring and most dating apps, especially Facebook dating and match group. And some of the best are Apple and Garmin and iRobot. So let's chat about some online dating and online apps. Dating apps are also not immune to security and privacy issues. And aspects that these um, apps share and take from you include location, sexual orientation, HIV data, status, political leanings, date of birth and religion. And there's been a heap of stories where things like this have been shared without people knowing or without people um, accepting that that's happened and people not taking responsibility for it either. The worst examples of dating apps are Facebook dating based on a heap of the problems that Facebook has had with privacy and security and Match Group. Match Group is an issue because it has 45 dating apps and these include a heap of the really popular ones like Tinder, Grindr, Hinge, OkCupid and Match. And the biggest issue with the Match Group is that their privacy policy, it's stating that you allow them to share your personal information with other match group sites for non-commercial purposes. So not only are you giving access to say Tinder, then you're also adding 44 other dating apps into that, which are all sharing your personal information. Which leads me to connecting social media accounts. So say, for example, you want to um, connect your um, uh, Bumble account to your Instagram account. Both the original app, say Bumble, and the linked app, say Instagram, collect more information. On their own, they're both collecting information, but when they're joined together, they're collecting even more data on you. So, you know, a short answer to that is do not link your dating apps. And researchers have also pointed out that algorithms, particularly with Tinder and Grindr, have much prejudice that's designed into it. And this is based on race, gender, ethnicity and age. And there are some better um, dating apps if you want to check them out. eHarmony, Happen and Lex. And then just as we have relationships online, some of those relationships 
can turn bad and technology can be misused in other ways like family violence. And this for Indigenous women, it doubles the risk for them. Technology facilitated abuse is gendered too. 96% are male perpetrators and 93% are female victims. Tracking apps on phones are increasingly used for abusive partners to keep track of women and children keeping, which keeps them constantly fearful and anxious. Ex-partners can also constantly text or use social media to send threats, and this is particularly prevalent with anonymous accounts. And there's a new-ish um, research that happened last year, and it's showing um, some really high increase in some, some of this technology facilitated abuse since 2015. For example, GPS tracking has increased by 244%, camera use has increased by 183%, and children who are used to monitor their mother has increased by 346 percent and that just means the father gives their child a digital device that has some sort of tracking device on it so because they assume the child will always be around their mother therefore the father knows exactly where the mother is via the child and obviously this causes a lot of stress and it can cause some really bad mental health issues for the child being used in this way as well so if you're worried about some of these things with yourself or for someone you know, um, have a look at the tech safety information, check for door locks, check for tracing and monitoring devices on your, um, on, or your digital devices, check what access your smart devices have um, and stalking tools on phones and other digital devices. Also check your car because there's things like kill switches, which will stop your car or stall your car once you get outside of a certain area. So once you go past the school. And our government is also not the best with data collection. And, you know, COVID helped, helped this along as well. And they're collecting more and more data without consent. And this sharing of our data is leading to more errors. And this only is worsening because of the volume and speed of being able to share this data. The people who are most at risk are the people who access government services more than the average Australian. And these are marginalised people like First Nations, disabled, elderly and young people. There's a lot of new laws that are being talked about at the moment, which I'll go into in a moment. And this can encourage the government to share any and all personal data without the public knowing or consenting to what's being um, gathered and how it's actually being used. And there's a variety of concerns, including weak consent requirements, lack of privacy safeguards, bypassing existing privacy laws, and we're also finding there's a discrepancy between public statements from the government and the actual legislation that's in place. And there's an over-reliance from the government on this whole good intent aspect rather than actual safeguards and real protections. And there's a heap of ways our government has failed us with technology. And a really big aspect is robo-debt. And you might have heard of this. Um, this is where private data held by Centrelink was compared against the Australian Taxation Office averaged income data. And this generated fake debt notices for vulnerable people. And they still kept doing this even when they found out that it was illegal. Because of robo debt that cost $2 billion and it was meant to raise $3 billion for the federal government. 300,000 people have been affected. It's caused them homelessness, immense trauma, stress, anxiety, and mental illness, a heap of debt, and even deaths. And here's a great quote. The government is once again getting away with being shysters while making the little people feel like it is they who did wrong. Another example is Centrelink disclosing someone's new address to her former partner who had a, a violence order out against her, against him. 
And the government demands to be trusted without first demonstrating to be trustworthy, and in fact, demonstrating the opposite. <coughs> Here's some examples of the digital reforms that the government is talking about at the moment. There's the online safety bill, and this is to keep Australians safe online and increase the e-safety commissioner's power to remove online abuse, force app stores and services to remove access and enforce verification, like facial scanning before looking at age-restricted material. Then there's the data availability and transparency bill, which is making it easier for the government to share data with others and other government services. Then there's the Privacy Act review, which is a review of a 30 year old act. And this is focusing on identifying and defining how we use our personal information, where there's some legal ramifications, invasions of privacy, and how to notify people who've had their data breached. This review needs to come before the data availability and the transparency bill. And a really great um, aspect to model um, this review would be Europe's General Data Protection Regulation, the GDPR, which you might have heard of. That would be a great area to look into. Then we have the Surveillance Legislation Amendment, which is the Identify and Disrupt Bill. And this is going to amplify police powers to create intrusive warrants without any judge signature. And there will be three warrants that can be gained. The ability to modify, add, delete or copy data, the ability to access networks and devices, and the ability to take over online accounts to investigate. Then we've got the digital identification identity legislation, which is going to centralise how Australians prove their identity online. And this they want similar to Facebook and Google, where you can sign into Facebook, then you can sign into all these other things. But this also includes facial recognition software. So there's a lot of privacy, there's a lot of security aspects there, and that's just some of the main ones that are happening at the moment. And another example of um, our government uh, taking our data and using it against us without our knowledge is in the South Australian Liberal government. There was a website that was uh, the South Australian governmental website that gave COVID information and gave press releases. When people clicked around the site, it, gave, it, it linked to a data harvesting platform called Nation Builder. Now, the government has claimed that these redirections were accidental, no one knew about it and no data was collected, and a privacy watchdog has actually concluded that it was probable they didn't know what had happened either. But it raises red flags because this is a data harvesting company and a campaign tool that's used to collect data for political campaigns. Trump used it, both sides of Brexit used it, and the New Zealand Labor um, political party also used it. Much data is collected from your name to social media accounts to computer details. And all this is added together to give your individual profile. And the reason why this can happen in Australia is because political companies are exempt from the Privacy Act, which was one of the aspects we talked about in the previous slide. So they're free to collect your personal information and your data. And then let's talk about more government surveillance, because this has been happening because of COVID. COVID has provided excuses for companies and for governments to use more surveillance tactics under the guise of public health and safety. This has allowed for more surveillance and censorship, including how and when people are tracked and restricting online speech in more than 20 countries. As you can see in the um, diagram, a lot of that is related to the US, but there's a heap of stuff that's happening in Australia too. We have intensified and expanded police power during COVID, and this has resulted in expanding laws, reducing scrutiny, and a risk of authoritarianism. 
and some policing practices supersede or undermine public health goals, which is the whole idea of why a lot of them were created in the first place, supposedly. And this COVID policing has allowed the intensification of selective criminalization processes. And this is disproportionately focused on First Nation peoples and street policing and the ability of policing radicalized and socioeconomically disadvantaged communities, particularly with public housing. And another great example, probably one of the best examples of Australia, Australian government's, federal government's fails is the COVID safe app. There's been a heap of contract tracing apps that have been introduced and um, Australia's was notable because of the substandard technology from the federal government. It had data privacy issues, technical flaws, security issues, human rights implications. It normalized surveillance and it was a total waste of taxpayers' money. Tens of billions of dollars were spent on development work on the app and advertising and all of this went to companies involved with the Liberal Party. Not one person from the app was found that contract tracing had not already detected. So that was a lot of money that was wasted that could have gone to better aspects like, you know, getting vaccinations for people. There are many issues with the COVID safe apps, like the effectiveness, privacy and accessibility. And one of the aspects that was a major issue was that people needed to be close to each other for 15 minutes to even register as a close contact. Then we move on to vaccine passports, which will be the next thing that's coming. Can these be ethically and legally tracked to encourage travel and event attendance, which is what people want. They want to be able to travel, they want to go to events. So maybe, but based on um, what we know and how governments have been and the amount of money that can be made from technology companies and the data that they can gain for us, I'm not sure about that. But it's necessary that if we're using sensitive health information, that there's transparency, that we limit the purpose and the amount of data that's gathered, and we collect data only for the reason we're specifying, and that the data is securely stored. Companies also need to ensure that people are not discriminated against or treated unfairly based on a health status and that the data is stopped from use after the pandemic ceases, like they don't just sell it to whatever health company gives them the most money for it. And even though regulations are unfolding when needed, the general rule from a privacy perspective is that the extent you can do something with less information, that's usually better. And in the workplace, we're also having a heap more surveillance, especially with a lot of people working remotely. Technical innovations and the efficacy has encouraged the gathering, processing and storage of more data. And issues that come from this include power dynamics of surveillance at work, use and ownership of data, pressure from the workplace and human resource practices. Software is used for facial recognition technology, mouse tracking, keystrokes, what websites you visited, hours you've worked, and it even can recognize if you're concentrating or not. What once was used for security or regulation monitoring has now moved to monitoring productivity. Surveillance cannot solve the problem of employees being more productive, only strong and effective leadership can do that. Then we move on to students who are also um, relying, a lot of schools and universities are also relying on teaching and learning online. And some universities, it's compulsory for privately owned companies to use your information and they don't have to be transparent with the data and information they're gathering. 
students who use these systems often have their data used to develop and improve education technology without any notifications or negotiations with students, parents or the faculty. An example of this is ProctorU that's used in Australia and in particular in America and there have been a lot of data that's been taken from hacking from um, schools that has been put out online including facial recognition. And monitoring is not beneficial for a learning environment, just as it's not beneficial if you're working to be monitored all the time. It stresses students out when they're taking exams and disproportionately affects women, people of colour, non-binary and trans people. And also, it's another way of encouraging te surveillance technology, this time in education. And our children are also being affected as well. You know, you think, okay, well, I know what I'm doing. I'm an adult, rah, rah, rah. But children, their brains are not at the same sort of stage as we are. They're very influenced. They're very vulnerable. 70% of Australian teenagers use Facebook and 75% of them use Instagram. Facebook has misused personal data from so many people over the years and it's collecting young users' data as well and it's targeted or creating mental health issues and, it's and vulnerabilities related to advertising. So for an example, um, a few years back, they were talking about how the algorithms were able to exploit vulnerable young people that were as young as 14, and they were shown particular advertising. And this was, yeah, a few years ago, and lately, research has just done some research on advertising vulnerabilities so young people who have harmful or risky interests they can at a low cost be targeted to ad advertisers can target them at a real low cost for things like gambling smoking vaping alcohol extreme weight loss 18 plus publications and even online dating for children even though Facebook restricts advertising alcohol, it can allow the targeting of people who are interested in alcohol. And um, this research that was done by Risa, they found that 77% of 16 and 17 year olds are concerned about how much data Facebook collects about them. And 65% disapproved of commercial advertising profiling. 65% of parents are also uncomfortable with targeting children and tracking offline. If you're interested in more information about making sure our children are safe online, make sure you check out Reset. And I would like to talk about digital literacy now, which I think is a very important part of using technology in general, is understanding things. Exploitative technologies have proliferated due to a lack of collective understanding about how platforms work and how they impact us. Unintended consequences take the form of mental health, democracy and discrimination issues. Those of us who rely on these platforms are unknowingly complicit in a devil's bargain. We trade our freedom for followers, our social cohesion for instant connection and the truth for what we want to hear. So um, I'd like you next time when you're deciding whether to add a new app or even use something online, I'd like you to pause and just to consider whether or not it's something you need to do, whether it's health, healthy in your life, whether it will make you um, addicted or continue to being addicted. And I want you to make an informed conscious decision. And this will help you ensure lifelong healthy digital habits that are created and maintained. And digital literacy is just one aspect of my digital equilibrium approach. And this is a model that aims to identify, manage and improve imbalance, stressors, reactive, addictive and unconscious behaviours online. The whole idea of this is to balance technology. And this is with intention as in mindful and conscious use. And you can have a look at my website, Digital Equilibrium, it'll be launched very shortly.
Humane technology is a new thing that's gaining quite a bit of traction lately. And it's just ensuring that technology is created in a humane way instead of using our psychology against us. As I mentioned before, to restore trust in big technology, it's been said that CEOs need to act first and talk later. Some areas they can do this are responsible AI, automation and upskilling, sharing the prosperity with new jobs and skills, codifying trust in a fair and explainable aspects, increasing diversity, equity and inclusion. And some um, people you might want to get in contact is the Center for Humane Technology in the US and Humane Technology in Australia, which is just a new group. Some tips going forward. Make sure that you understand and learn more about your technology and check your settings regularly. Do you actually need that app or do you need to use it or do you need to use it right now? an example you could use it on your computer instead so say for example me I've never put Facebook on my phone because I know that the Facebook app is what like really really bad with collecting data so if I use Facebook which I do begrudgingly um, I just use it on my desktop and I just go in do what I have to and go out and some other search engines you could use instead of Google are Brave DuckDuckGo or Vivaldi. And please use Signal over WhatsApp and Facebook Messenger. And um, if you don't have a VPN, that would also be good to use. And you can use my referral where we both get 30 days free. I hope this has helped you um, just learn some more information about how our data is collected and how it can be used against you. Really want you going forward to control what you can. Don't stress out too much, but more education, be aware, be informed, and that will help you control more. Remember that technology is not evil and it's also not a solution to all of our problems. It's a tool and you need to use it as a tool. Don't let it use you. So understand, be more aware of your behaviours and put some practices into, into place, like my pause, consider, decide method. And ask yourself, is convenience worth trading in our privacy for? So I'd like to thank um, Pauzi for this. I'd like to thank uh, Data Science Week. And thank you very much for paying attention. I will be putting the video on YouTube in the next day or so. The slides will also be on SlideShare. There are all my websites that you can connect with me on with the Digital Equilibrium website launching within the next few weeks to a month have to update a few things first. And you can find me on Twitter and begrudgingly on Facebook. Thank you very much. And I'll just see if we have any questions. No chat. So um, I will just stop that there. And thank you very much for your attention today. And um, if you have any questions, please get in contact and please see more of the information for Digital Science Week and get involved. Thanks all.